It's easy to forget the continuity of our story sometimes. There's so many disparate pieces, so many segments, so many books, 66 in all, each with their own author, their own perspective, many written in their own era or period of time, Old Testament and New. And at the beginning of our story, what we find is a creator who has taken time to do something extraordinary and has formed humankind from the dust of the earth and breathed it to life, animated it, kissed it to existence, performed CPR, call it what you want. This dust has become life. And not just any life, life made in the image of the one who made it. And not just imaged life, but life that God himself wants to know, interact with, walk with, relate to, care about, love. Adam and Eve journey with God in the garden. They meet with him there face to face. I have no idea what that must have looked like. I have no idea what that must have felt like. However we want to understand the fall, whatever our definition or view of sin, it was that which caused that level of human divine interaction to cease. No longer could God be seen by mortals. No longer could that fellowship endure. No longer could two journey together. We went our way. God went God's way. Ever mindful. Ever planning. Ever hopeful. Plan of redemption long before born was enacted. And we've been through the season of Christ's coming. We've been through the season of Christ's ministry. We've been through the season of his trial, his death, his rest, his resurrection. And we're in a new season. Now is the time of his ascension and glorification. But I want to talk for a few minutes, just a few minutes, about the in-between time. Have you ever given it much thought? I don't often think about it. I'm glad if you do. Good for you. But I have not given a great deal of thought to what happened between Resurrection Sunday and when he ascended to on high. I've read the text. I know that there were many witnesses over 500 in all. And I know that he must have done routine things. I'm guessing somewhere along that 40 days he slept. I'm guessing. In fact, I have biblical evidence that he ate. I'm guessing that there were certain routines of human existence that he re-entered. But what did he do with this time? What we find in the scripture is that it says... It exceeded, what he did in that time exceeded all that came before. In other words, there aren't volumes enough to record what Jesus said and did in that time. It may be hyperbole, but the idea is that Jesus came back to life and did something remarkable. He gave people who had never been able to walk with God before, the chance to walk once again with their Creator. He restored the option of walking with the Creator of the universe on a beach by a lake in Galilee. And as I'm sure God taught Adam and Eve long ago how reality worked, what things were, taught him of himself, the master 
the resurrected Jesus Christ taught once again. Imagine, I know this thrills me, imagine if you had perfect recall. Now, I know we have people with extraordinary memories, but what would perfect recall look like? Now, I'm not talking about a photographic memory, per se. That's a different kind of recall. I'm talking about the kind of recall that allowed you to remember everything you were taught. I would find that meaningful. I look back at college courses, and sometimes I find I don't even remember that I took the course let alone remember what the syllabus looked like or what my textbook said and forget the lectures. I know I was there. I got a passing grade. All the evidence says that I learned something in that course, but I can't remember. Imagine now that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and he keeps saying all these strange things, some of which make no sense at all. In three days, I'll tear down this temple and build it back up. About that time you're tuned out, you're thinking about the fish and the loaves you're going to eat for supper. About that time you're wondering what your wife is doing back at home. About that time you're thinking about the taxes that are due. You're even looking at the bumblebee on the dandelion. You're anywhere but where Jesus is, listening to what Jesus is saying. If we put a cartoon up, the caption would be blah, 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 blah. Why? Not because Jesus is blah, 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 blah. It's the master teacher. It's because we have the attention spans of gnats. It's because we do not remember perfectly. We don't even remember well most of the time. It's because while we're teachable, we're not easy to teach. It's why it takes us 20 years to raise a child. 20. No, make that more like 25. And some of us don't give up even then. They're still holding out hope. It takes a great deal to get a thought into our heads. The standard wisdom on preaching is say it once, Say it again, tell them what you just said, and then come back and recapitulate it again. I try not to do that. I think you're much brighter than that. Maybe I'm being optimistic. (laughs) You're much brighter than that. I'm staying with that. I'm I'm, I'm believing in that. I I don't want to repeat myself. Imagine if you could remember all of the teachings of the Master. Only you can't. None of us can. For three years, Jesus has walked with and taught the disciples. And for a good part of that three years, their understanding has simply been evolving. They don't really get who he is in the Gospel of Mark until the centurion declares it. They don't even get it until the centurion declares it. Surely this was whom... The Son of God. Finally, the light dawns. End of Mark. End of the Gospel. Now, I'm not being hard on the disciples or hard on you or even hard on me. I'm simply pointing to the fact that we as human beings don't often learn as well or as quickly or in the first instance as we might. We certainly don't always remember. The disciples have this amazing gift. Can you imagine? I'm using that word a lot because it requires your imagination. But can you imagine how bereft you would feel watching this person die? You see, when someone is tortured the way he was, torn flesh, dehydration, the dis the distension of joints, the fracturing of joints, the wrists, ankles. When somebody's organs are failing because they can't get air, and finally their heart stops after hours and hours of pain and shock, it's over. You know it's over. I know it's over. They all knew it was over. 
And for them, the overness of that moment was overwhelming. It wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they were looking for. How could this wonderful, kind, amazing, generous, healing, helpful person, insightful like none other ever before, suffer so cruelly? And what did he said? Do you remember what he said about this? I can't remember. Do you? Well, it was something like, didn't he talk about three days? Yeah, I guess. Well, where were you? I think I was thinking about food. What about you? Jesus comes back. And in his resurrected form is able to not only witness to the resurrection, but is able to remind his disciples of those things he taught them in the first place. To help them connect the teachings of the Old Testament and all that was looked for in the promised Messiah and who it was that he was. He was able to help them remember those things that he had taught them about himself and about God, the Father, and how important they were to the Father. And he was able to connect all of that to the promise of one yet to come because no longer would God leave man alone to his own devices or her own devices. No longer. Now, communion with God was made possible again in Christ, and he wasn't going to leave them to their thoughts. He promised a comforter. He promised a spirit. He promised to send a comforter to them. Powerful, rich. And so in these days, we see some things about Christ that we may not have seen prior to this horrible crucifixion and this wonderful resurrection. Let's go to our texts for today and take a look. In the Gospel of Luke, we get a somewhat truncated version of the story. Luke 24. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So there it is, Jesus connecting for them the prophecies, the teachings of Scripture to the fulfillment that they have in their hearing. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Is there anyone available today to help you do that? It's not a trick question. Yes, there is. The Spirit has been sent to help you open your mind to the scriptures. I would love to go off on a riff on the matrix right now, but I'll do that another time. Those of you who know me know what that's about. He opened their minds. Another word for that might be opening the eyes of our heart. What a strange thing to say. Opening our spiritual awareness or insight, creating a capacity to receive God in a way that we couldn't before. In fact, when we couldn't before. Opening our minds so that they could understand what was said of the one true God. This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay until the, into the, excuse me, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The word there for power in the Greek is the same word we use today for dynamite. Dunamis. You will be clothed with dynamite from on high. <coughs> Sounds pretty moving. A little scary even. When we 
When he had led them out of the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The truncated version, but it communicates. That 40 days is compressed into Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That 40 days is compressed into a reminder of the one that has been and the one who is coming. That 40 days is compressed, and he will open their minds, and they worshiped at the temple continually, praising God, awaiting the promised comforter. In Ephesians, Paul tells us something truly profound. He uses this word power or dynamite as well. But let's look at it. Ephesians, excuse me, 1.15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul's standard sort of greeting, the way he encourages the churches. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the Spirit, capital S, of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. There it is, opening our minds. It's praying that our minds might be opened, that we might be able to receive, that we might be able to see, that our journey may be with God in the garden of our lives in the same way that Adam and Eve walked with Jesus then. I pray that the eyes of your heart, there's that phrase, might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. This is such hyperbole. We're already drifting off. We're already lost in the words. We're already not comprehending. Father, help us. Because the words here are of your strength and your power and a revelation of who you are. The eyes of our heart, this isn't literal. The enlightenment is not one of actual light. Our light, our eyes receive light and reflect it. When we speak of the brightness of somebody's eyes, they don't glow in the dark. We're speaking of reflected light. When we speak of light received into the eyes, we're referring to that which will enable us to perceive a reality around us. And so the eyes of our heart speak to that which points us to the greatest truth. Some cultures use it as guts, some cultures brains, but the idea is that we know who the living God is, who has called us, and the riches of his inheritance powerful one. Most of us will receive a pittance for an inheritance. In fact, we do hope that our parents live to spend all of their money and leave us with nothing. But should they leave us something, it's not likely to be great. Few of us are the sons or daughters of the elite, of the wealthy. The riches of God's inheritance, on the other hand, defy imagination. Verse 19, and his incomparably great power for those who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of dynamite. Are you catching this? I don't want to beat it to death. Not only does he give us an inheritance, but power is ours when we believe. Not just any power, resurrection power. Not just any power, glorification power. Not just any power, sovereign power. From a kingdom that has no end. Far above all rule, and authority, power and dominion, 
and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but the one to come. That pretty much covers it all. And God placed all things, not some, not a few, not heavenly things, all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, to the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That is not ambiguous language. That is not hyperbole. It is not exaggeration. That is Paul under the influence of this spirit who has opened the eyes of his heart speaking to you and me about the resurrected Jesus Christ who ascended and stands in glory, sits at glory, however you want to phrase that, at the right hand of the Father. The power of the resurrection, the power of the ascension, the power of the glorification is ours if we believe in addition to the inheritance he promises us of eternal life. For we have died with Christ, Paul says, don't forget that. We partake in his crucifixion. And on the other side of that, we are also resurrected with Christ. That we might live, not us, but Christ in us, the King of glory. That is the Christian walk. That is the journey in which we now have access to God. This is the place of communion and power. Acts. Chapter 1, 1 to 11 This was also read, but I will read it again. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. There's another witness. Luke witnesses the fact that Jesus teaches from the time of his resurrection to the day of his ascension. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, So he teaches them and he witnesses to 500-some people surrounding them. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, see, I wasn't making that up, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel or to Israel? Um, I think something was not communicated there. You see, we're, we're like them. We're still wondering, well, so what does that mean for us? Are you going to fix this place or not? Is, is, are you going to get rid of the Romans or aren't you? Post-crucifixion. And they're still wondering about the kingdom of Israel. See, what do we know about kingdoms and empires? What do we know? They come and they go. This is what we know. There isn't a kingdom that hasn't fallen. There isn't an empire that hasn't grown and then run into crisis, receded, and finally died a very hard death. There isn't a people that have cruelly dominated the world that haven't ultimately paid the price themselves. And they want to know when Jesus is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. My friends, have we set our sights too low? Have we missed the meaning of the resurrection? Do we fail to see Christ in glory? Do we not understand what Paul said a minute ago? That every dominion, every kingdom, every person, everything has been put under the feet of Christ, under his footstool? That's the image of dominion. If we were to take a photo of you lying on the ground and me with my foot on your head, what would that communicate? Dominion. It would communicate not that you're in charge or not that you're the victor or not that you're the one who's prevailed. It would, it would co- communicate that I was the victor, the one who had prevailed, that I was the victorious one, the superior one. 
When God says everything has been placed under the footstool of Christ, who's in dominion? Christ. He is the king. And they're saying, will you restore Israel? He said to them, so gently, so patiently still, look, it's not for you to know times and dates, which the Father sets by his own authority. But listen to this again, again. You will receive power, dunamis, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in surrounding Judea and in Samaria and from there to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before them in their, to their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up to the sky as he was going when, two, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. We've seen these two men before, haven't we? Did they not appear in the garden? Who do you seek? He's not here, he's risen, they've said. And here they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Quit gawking. Quit gawking. The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Now it's time to fulfill all that he said. You're going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in surrounding Judea, in Sumeria, and from there to the ends of the world. That's my kingdom. My kingdom doesn't know borders. My kingdom doesn't know boundaries. My kingdom doesn't know race. My kingdom doesn't know any of this. My kingdom is of the world and of the universe beyond for everything Christ has been put under Christ's feet. Everything. That's the season we're in. That's the power we have access to. That's the journey that we are hopefully on. What in your life is worth more than that? What? What of your possessions, what of your work, what of your family, what of yourself, what of your ambitions, what of your hopes and dreams is worth more than that? You see, Jesus, when he came to us, was so incredibly generous, so incredibly gracious. We were a fallen race, unworthy to be called sons and daughters. And he told us the story of a young man who ran away and squandered his wealth and lowered himself to be a one who fed and lived with pigs of all things. And when he came home, the father received him running to the road running down the road to meet him throwing himself at the boy kissing him in his filth covering him with a robe and taking him home and placing upon him a ring and calling him a son and welcoming him home jesus was so generous and so kind he said, at one time you were known as servants, but no longer will I call you servants, but friends. Friends. You'll be my friends, Jesus wow. says. That's so incredibly generous. In other texts, Jesus who takes on our humanity who enters this world as a human being, who suffers the indignity of becoming creaturely and glorifies us all in the process and makes this vessel we carry so much more sacred by his having done so. He's lifted us all up and elevated us all. And he doesn't just say, I'm going to do that and then I'm going to escape that. He carries it on. 
and he calls us brothers and sisters because we have been declared children of God once again. As Adam was a son of God, so you are sons and daughters of God, children of God, loved, cherished, cared for, blessed, longed for. He wants to walk in your garden, whatever that is, with you. He's more than a brother, more than a friend. He's more than a savior. He's king of kings, lord of lords, under whom everything has been placed. He's the victor and the one who will come in glory in the same way that he ascended and give to us that inheritance promised. What's worth more than that? Nothing. Nothing's worth more than that. Nothing. And so today, I just want to remind us not only of what it is that we're living in and who it is that loves us and who it is that has called us and blessed us and saved us. But I want to remind us of the value that he's placed on you. That the Spirit is there to open the eyes of your heart. That the Spirit is there to open your minds, if you'll but ask, to the words of God that you might understand, that you might hear and begin to remember. That that which you've been taught might come back to you that that which you've received might grow within you. That the kingdom of God, which never ends and knows no greater superior force, power, entity, nothing, that the kingdom of God might grow until it fills the whole earth. That's a big command. And it's yours through the power of of the resurrected, ascended, and glorified Jesus Christ.